which is our wrong practice test number one, number four, and we're ready for D. D is a multiplication problem, and we are going to multiply matrix D times matrix A. So there's D, and here's A. Now, before you do anything, check to make sure that it is possible. Remember in multiplication, to be possible, you have to have the same middle dimension. So this one is a two by three. Some of us are still mixing that up. Rows go across, just like the bleachers. So there's two rows, and there are three columns. Don't count numbers. Go up. Actually, take your pencil and go across. That's rows. So this one has three rows and three columns. Because these match, we can multiply. You could not add these. The rule for add is different, but the rule for multiplication is these match. They do. And when I multiply, my answer will be a two by three. Would you agree with me so far? I think so. All right. Now, to fill in the blanks, it's really easy, these blanks right here. Pick a blank, I'm gonna start with the beginning. I like to be organized. That is in the first row, first column. So I am going to multiply the first row times the first column. So I will multiply negative two, one, four, that's my first row, times one, negative one, zero, that's my first column. I multiply each pair and add them up. So that's gonna give me negative three <coughs> as a total. Negative two, negative one, and four. Or excuse me, zero. Negative two, negative one, and zero. Now, Pick another blank. I'll just work my way across. I'll pick this one. That is in the same row, first row, but now I'm going to use the second column. So my first row is the same as it was before, negative 2, 1, 4. But now my second column is 2, 1, 3. No, no, the answers have to go in whatever spot you were fit, filling in. So if I'm doing first row, second column, that's got to go here. So that'll be what? Negative 4 and 1 and 12. 9? Yes. All right, go ahead, fill in the rest of them. Work your way across. So for this one, you're still going to use the negative 2, 1, 4. But now you're going to use the third column for this blank right here. So go ahead and do that while I take attendance. Oop, Katie's out. Negative one, and I get negative one. 
So remember, it already starts with this. Yep, Rem quickly, please. Remember, if we're in the bottom row, here, if I'm filling in these blanks, then I have to be using the bottom row of numbers here. So I'm using zero, one, and negative one, and then matching that up with my column. So for that one, it would be the first column. Anytime you multiply by zero, you get zero. So the only one here that has an answer is negative one. So that's why we put negative one there. Okay. All right. How about E? What is E asking me to do? Problem E. Find the inverse. Finding the inverse is a two-step process. Does anyone remember the steps? of finding the inverse. You have to go down and up. So first we have to find the determinant. Yeah. So the first step is find the determinant. So the matrix is this, and the first thing we have to do is find the value of the determinant. Remember, there's a difference, the numbers are the same, but there's a difference between the bracket and the straight line. The straight lines tell you to do exactly what she said go down then up. What she means is one times three, two times negative one, and then we subtract those. So it's always downs, downs, minus ups. So three minus negative two, that's five. The value of that determinant is five. Step one, find the determinant. Now, what's the second part of that? Um, someone over there. You switch the three and the one and then switch the second one. So the set, yes, you're right. The second part is we make this new matrix and it's kind of random how we do it. We just have to know how to do it. The, she said, what we do is we take these two numbers in this spot and we switch them. So the three and the one. Then we do the opposite, put the opposite number for the other two. So this is a positive two, so we put a negative two. This is a negative one, so we put a positive one. So these two switch places, and these two, we change their signs. Then what? Same thing. No, they put a five and then, then yeah. you whatever you got here for your determinant, you put all these numbers or you put all these numbers over that. If anything simplifies, to get full credit, you're gonna have to simplify. So if you had two over ten, you would want to make that one fifth. But in this particular problem, I don't think anything simplifies. So that's the inverse. This is the inverse. Okay, two-step process. All right, one more. What about F? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Why? What are the dimensions of matrix A? Three by three. Three by three. What are the dimensions of matrix C? Two by two. Two by two. Can those be multiplied? No. No. So you write down impossible, can't do, empty set, whatever you want to write down that indicates you can't do the problem. Okay? All right. Now we got number five. So the next one you have to write down the second one. Yep. So remember, this is exactly what your test looks like. So you are going to have to do one of these three by three determinants. So like Mary Kate said, you are going to want to recopy the first two columns. Now, don't overthink this. If I said to you what's the first column, would you say this guy right here? Mm -hmm. So you copy him right here. And then what's the second column? We'll do one. We copy it right here. 
Don't mix things around. Just recopy those first two columns right in order. Okay? Now what? Now we're going to do the same multiplication we did before. We're going to do downs minus ups, but there's more of it because it's a bigger setup. So we'll start right here. Down gives me negative 15. Down gives me negative 4. And down gives me 0. And then I add those up. So I'm adding up a negative 15, a negative 4, and a 0. So that's negative 19. That's my downs. So now I'm going to find my ups. So that one is 6. This one is 10. And that one is 0. And I add them up. Remember, as you go down the diagonal, you are multiplying. So you multiply, and you multiply, and you multiply, and then you add that up. And then you multiply, 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 and add that up. Then, what do you do with these two numbers? Okay. Subtract. It's always down minus up. So it's negative 19 minus 16. Negative 35 will be the answer to the question. So always minus. Always minus. Downs minus ups. Okay? All right, now we have a little vocab section. All right, so 6a. Remember, your test looks just like this. What are the dimensions of that matrix? No, it's two by four, two rows, right? Go this way with your pencil, two rows, four columns. What is A sub two one in this matrix? Five, because we're looking for the entry that is in the second row, first column. Paying attention? Okay. Okay. I'll make sure you're doing this with us now. So do you this or do it on this one? In the expression, oh, this will see who's been paying attention. In the expression 2A, where A is a matrix, what is 2 called? It's called a scalar. You might want to go back and look at some of your vocab. It's called a scalar. Is there an option for it? Is it always just scalar? I don't even know what it is. It's always just scalar, yes. D, what is a square matrix? Okay, that's an example of a square. A two Same by two. Rows Same columns. number of rows as columns. That's right. So two by two, three by three, four by four. Those are all square matrices. So your, def your actual definition is matrices that have the same number of rows as columns. But a two by two is an example for sure. And then E, define matrix. Take your notes out and find that definition. Because when we did it, day one, I said this will be a test question. You want to say that a little bit louder, Annie? But angular array of numbers arranged in rows and columns. That's it. That should be in your notes. Claire's found hers. Does it say a rectangular array of numbers arranged in rows and columns? She wrote hers down. I hope you all did. A matrix is a rectangular array of numbers arranged in rows and columns. That's in your notes. Look it up. Before we go on to the next page, I want you to, this is practice test one. I want you to look at practice test two, 6E. Define matrix. Practice test three, 6E. So we're going to have to 
Yes, you are. Very good, William. That is absolutely correct. You're going to have to define matrix. And if you miss it, don't you come whining and complaining to me. Right? You got to know what a matrix is. That's it. I don't think that's unreasonable. You can do it. All right, look at the next page. This is our linear programming problem. So while I'm getting it set up, would you um, fill in the chart? Did you have a question, William, before? Okay. So go ahead and fill in the chart. While I get it set up. Oh, we've never had one like this. This would be interesting. It's the number one. Let's drop it. All right, so this one's a little bit different. Some of it's the same. Some of it I think you can fill in. Let's see. Um, to stay in business, it must sell at least 10 hamburgers, but not more than 40. So what that means is, I think you know, you have to sell between 10 and 40 hamburgers. And that is called a fixed interval because it's given you a lower and an upper boundary. It's given you an interval of numbers. So if I let hamburgers be X, the number of hamburgers is going to be X, then my fixed interval is X is between 10 and 40. Can you see that? I have to squeeze it in. That's what we have to write. That's what you have to write. That's your fixed interval. X is between 10 and 40. And then, what do I know about hot dogs? between 30 and 70. So if I let hot dogs be Y, then Y has to be between 30 and 70. Now in a minute, I'm gonna show you how to graph that. It cannot cook more than 30, or excuse me, more than 90 sandwiches all together. Where's that gonna go? 90 all together. The total number of sandwiches is 90. Uh, profit for a hamburger is 33 cents and a hot dog is 21 cents. Now, this one's different because of the fixed intervals. But don't panic, just stop. Remember in the beginning it was all hard, it's easy. We'll get it figured out. We wanna maximize our profit, right? So let's start there. What is that? How am I gonna calculate my profit? Uh, yep, 33 cents for every hamburger, which is X, and 21 cents for every hot dog, which is Y. So if I sell one of each, I'll make 33 plus 21. I'll make 54 cents if I sell one of each. Now, what's the top row tell me? Actually, it's less than or equal to 90 because, okay. I have to sell um, no more than 90. So whatever, however many I sell to all together, it's gotta be 90 or less. And then believe it or not, these are constraints. And, and it, it makes sense, I think. Constraints means what are the limits or the boundaries. So there's no equation for all of that together. These are their individual equations. So if you have a fixed interval, and it will say that in the chart, if you have a fixed interval, it is a constraint. So we got two of them right there. 
I know this is a little bit different, kids. That's life in the fast lane. You gotta roll with the punches. And then what are the two gimmies? Yep. So remember, you get points for everything. So even if you're a little confused, write down what you know for sure. Now, what does this look like when I graph it? Well, again, these are pretty big numbers, so I think I'll use tens. I'm gonna do this one in purple. So remember how we do this? We cover up one letter at a time. So it looks like I'll go up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's 90. Did I do that too fast? Do you remember how to do that? Yeah. I kind of missed that. I agree. And that one would be shaded below it. So I'm in the triangle here. Now what about these fixed intervals? Well, they're actually very easy to graph. This one deals with X. So I want you to come over and put a mark here at 10, that's 10, right? That's the point 10, zero. And 40, zero. Because it says X has to be between 10 and 40, right? So that means X is in between here, in between 10 and 40. So draw a nice vertical, oh, they're supposed to be straight, nice vertical lines and shade in between them. So in other words, however many hamburgers you sell have to be in that bar because that bar represents X's between 10 and 40. Now, what do you think I'm gonna do with my red marker now? So this was the green one. So now I'm gonna do the red one. This one involves Y. So on the Y axis, put a point at 30, 40, 50, and a point at 70. Oh, somehow I counted it wrong. That's all right. Let's erase that mark, there we go. And then this time, I'll come across And since I have to be between 30 and 70, oh, I got, I'm off because that's supposed to be 70. All right, I can't count today. Mm, yours probably looks better than mine, but okay. And then I'm gonna shade in between. Now there's a lot going on in this picture. Can you see the feasible region? Can you have five points? You can. You can have as many points as happen. So I am seeing, I'm gonna outline it. I am seeing this, I uh, know, this as the area that is between the red, between the green, and below the purple. Would you agree with me? What? Um, you don't have to have them, but they sure help. Yeah, I know. So did you get five dots? Yes. Now, some of those dots are easy. Here's what I mean. Remember when you drew this green line? Mm -hmm. That green line was where X is 10. So any point on that green line is going to have an X coordinate that's 10. So these two points, I know their X is 10. Well, don't you know it's also like 10, 70, and 10, 30? I'm not there yet. What do I know about the X for these? That X has to be 40. Now, what any point, any point on this green line has an X of 40. Now, Gabe is saying, well, wait a minute, you can do the same thing with the Y lines. 
So here, I know my y has to be 30. So this is the point 1030, and this is the point 4030. Up here, my y's have to be 70. So I know these two points have a y of 70. So this is the point 10 comma 70. Now, these points have blanks in them. I know this one has an x of 40 and this one has a y of 70. But remember, my purple equation said x and y have to add up to 90. So if x and y have to add up to 90, and y is 70, then x is 20. And if x and y have to add up to 90, but x is 40, then y will be 50. So actually, those fixed interval problems are easier because you don't have to do substitution and elimination. You just use the vertical lines and the horizontal lines to ha help you get at least part of the points. All right, so I'm gonna make a list. I got 1070, uh, 2070, 1030. The order doesn't matter, so I'm just writing them down as I see them here. 4050 and 4030. Will we have a calculator? Yes, yes. It is a lot. These are a lot. This 20, well I knew the y was 70, and I knew in my purple equation they have to add up to 90. So if I, I'm on the purple line here, that point's on the purple line. It's on other lines too, but it's on the purple one. So if I know y is 70, then x would have to be 20 to make it 90. Anything on the purple line, Jada, has to get 90. So, we go 90, 20, 70, 40, 50. Anything, if it's on the purple line in this problem, it has to add up to 90. If it's on the green lines, then I know the X is either 10 or 40. And if it's on the red lines, I know the Y is either 30 or 70. All right, so have you calculated this yet? Now, I always have kids ask this question. If you look at the situation, what does this mean? This means 10 hamburgers and 70 hot dogs? All right, let's talk about um, this one and this one. This is 10 hamburgers and 70 hot dogs. This is 20 hamburgers and 70 hot dogs. Does it make sense to you that this one is automatically gonna be bigger than that one? Yeah. So, exactly. So if you can tell that, you can exclude one. This says 10 times 33 plus 70 times 21. This is 20 times 33 plus 70 times 21. Obviously this one's gonna be bigger. If that confuses you, then work them all out. But sometimes you can just tell. Well, I know that one's going to be bigger. Like the 40, 30, and the 10, 30? Exactly. <laughs> if you make 10 hamburgers and 30 hot dogs, that is automatically going to be less than 40 hamburgers and 30 hot dogs, right? So feel free to exclude them if you're sure they're not there. Put an X and Y right here. So 0.33 times 10 plus 0.21 times 70. I'm going to go ahead and work them all out, even though... Some of them will be excluded. That's $18. I typed it in right. $20 or 20 times 0 0.33 plus 70 times 0.21. That one's 21.30. What's the matter, William? This is hard. No. All I'm doing now is typing in. So 10 times. 
40 times 33 plus 50 times 21. 2370. And finally, I don't know. I hope I typed those in right. I got 73. Good. Thank you. So now we're ready to make a, a decision. We're ready to give advice to this store or this hot dog stand or whatever. What are you going to tell them to do? Yep. For a profit of 23.70. So we should make. Forty hamburgers and fifty hot dogs for a profit of twenty three seventy. That's an awful lot of sandwiches for me at twenty three dollars, but it's like when I was little and my siblings and I we always had a huge garden, lived in the country. And we would set up a little stand out by the road and sell our cucumbers and our tomatoes and all that stuff. But the cucumbers were like five cents each. And so we would sell like this whole bushel basket of cucumbers, but we made like, made like 70 cents. But we were so excited. It was, it was so exciting. Where are you from? Northwestern Ohio, south of Toledo, about 40 miles. What college did you go to? Well, now it is called Trine, but back in the day it was called Tri-State University. It's right in the corner of Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana. Why'd you come here? Well, first of all, how did I end up at Trine, right? Because my husband, Trine is an engineering school primarily, and my husband's an engineer. So I met my husband, followed him to college. Bad idea, doesn't work for most people, but it worked for me. I've been married, it'll be 40 years this June, it worked. But I would not advise that, okay. <laughs> but I did. Got a great education, loved every minute of that. Very small school, perfect for me, okay. So then, he knew older than me, so he graduates before I do. So he gets a job in Indianapolis. So we know we're gonna get married as soon as I graduate. Um, another probably not greatest move, I was 22 when I got married. Again, it worked for me, but I would advise you to maybe wait a little bit. Um, <laughs> But anyhow, so obviously since he already had a job here, I needed to um, get a job here, or get a job in Indian I knew I was going to get married, moved to Indianapolis, had to have a job. So I got the, in college, at least when I went there, they had what were called placement directors, and they their job was to work with the graduating students and help them find jobs. I don't know how, they, how it's done now, but that's what they did back then. So my placement guy handed me this list. I, Again, I'm from the country. I mean, the backwoods. Our farmhouse, and my parents' farmhouse, is in the middle of fields. I mean, there's, this is country. And, um, yes, we did have, we had one phone. You guys made moonshine? One phone, no. <laughs> we had one phone, um, and that's a whole other story I'll tell you sometime. But anyhow, we had one phone. But anyhow, so, it was random chance I ended up at the funeral because I sent out like 50 applications to all the schools in Indianapolis. I mean, I'm applying everywhere. John Marshall, I remember sending that one because I thought, who's John Marshall? At John Marshall High School, Broad Ripple, <laughs> Tech. I mean, I'm applying everywhere, including, you know, townships, you know, Lawrence Central and all, all these places. Well, the first school that called me, I sent all this out. This was in April of my senior year. Oh, did I already tell you the story? Okay. No, no, no. No, you told me. No, no, no. 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 anyway, I think they were the first. They were the first. I think I told you the story about how I drove down here in Phoenix. Yeah. But no. I think they were here because they're the first school to respond. They called me in for an interview. I came in, interviewed, and they gave me the job. You're so here forever. That's yeah. right. What? Did you apply for something? Yeah. It's pretty much a I didn't apply for it. I mean, I applied <laughs> everywhere. 
Remember, our test looks just like this. So we are going to have a calculator problem. A calculator problem. First thing, you write down two things on your paper. Well, three if you count the actual answer. Okay? You've got to write down, if you want to get credit for this problem, you're going to do it totally on your calculator, but if you want to get credit for it, you have got to write down the matrix you're putting in. Now, I'm going to put my variables up here. I have P, Q, R, S, and then my equals number. And i got to make sure everything's lined up. So 1P, negative 2Q, 3R, negative 5S, negative 34. Everybody remembering this? Okay, mm -hmm. so we write all this down. If something is missing, like in row two, equation two, there is no R. There's no R. There's no P. And I have one Q, negative one R, negative one S, and one. And then I have, oh again, no P, two, three R, no S, and a negative five. All right, make sure, take your time. This is one problem on this whole page. So take your time, make sure you've got all the numbers right. We're gonna put that matrix into our calculator, we're gonna RREF it, and an answer is gonna come out. And we're gonna write that down when we get to it. And that's gonna tell me what PQR and S are. Can I stop up here? Well, and the dimensions, yeah. So, hang on a second. So I'm gonna go to second matrix, and over to edit and hit enter. First thing it wants to know is how big a matrix are you putting in? So this is a four by five, right? So Mary Kate, if you're struggling with that, watch my pencil. One, two, three, four. So four by five. And then I start putting the numbers in, and I'm not worried, I just type over anything that's already in there. Okay, you remember what to do when you get it all in? Once you get all those numbers in, you press second quit. Because once you're done putting them in, you're done with that. Done. So quit. Now we go back in, second matrix, over to math, and then all the way down to RREF. Enter. Then one more time, we go to second matrix, and just hit enter. Twice. And it should pull up this matrix. See, if you don't get this matrix, you probably put a number in wrong. There's no rounding. Then I messed it. Yep. Yep. So chances are, Mary Kate, I got all those numbers, but I got decimal points. Yeah. Okay, you shouldn't have decimal points. Oh, you mean it says ne negative 1.00? Like point zero one eight. No, no, you got a mistake in there someplace. So, and it's probably, just go back to edit and put these numbers in again because you probably just put a zero in the wrong spot or left a negative off or something like that. After second point, what did you do? You said matrix again. Second matrix, over to math down to RREF, enter, and then second matrix, enter again. 
So this is what you need to come up with. Okay, if you came up with something, then you did it all right. You just mistyped a number somewhere. Okay, so that's why I'm not alarmed by it. Um, Okay, well, this is the answer, so yeah. I don't know. Do you I, think something's wrong with our calculator? No, I think your calculator's fine. I still think there's something wrong with one of your numbers. But I can check it later. I want to finish this problem. So then we write down our final answer, mm -hmm. which is right here in this column. So negative 1, 2, negative 3, and 4 is the answer to the problem. So. I know that's a whole page. It'll be a whole page on your test probably, but all you need to do is matrix in, matrix out, and answer. Okay. Hurry up. Okay, so let's move on to practice test two. alarm clock? Yeah. I love it, Mary Kate. All right. I got a rooster. <laughs> you do? Yeah. Can you impersonate it for us? Okay, here's your mistake. This is this is what I'm doing. So underneath up there, underneath oh, that's what always happens. So just double check your matrix. We had chickens too. Um, interestingly enough, we didn't have chickens until I got in first grade. And in first grade, one of our projects was we hatched some chicks in an incubator, like Mrs. Mills was, you know. And then when the chicks came out, there was a drawing to see who would get, who could take home the chickens. Well, the only thing I've ever won in my life was a chicken. <laughs> And then when I got a chicken, she was a hen, we had to get a rooster, and then my sisters and brothers had to have chickens. So since there's six of us, we ended up with a whole flock of chickens. Like you just sat around and you played with that chicken? Yeah, what do you do with the chicken? Did you like pick up a lot? No. Did you pick it up? They're not really pets. Mine I could pick up. Some of the other ones were too wild, but mine, well, she's a little bad. What, she's cute. What do you name your chicken? You're not going to believe this. Now remember, I was in first grade. First grade. Her name was Little Red Hen. Little Red Hen. Yeah. Every time you're like, come here, Little Red Hen. Yeah, but she didn't always come. That's not They they come around you when you take the feed out. You know, when you go to feed them, they come out. But did you ever get them confused? Not mine. We have uh, some of my siblings had white ones, white chickens. Mine was she was actually a little banny. I mean, she was like reddish colored, but reddish brownish. But some of the white ones, I mean, I didn't care. They all looked the same to me. But maybe they no, they were we never ate the chickens. So what did you do when they died? Did you bury them? Mm -hmm. My grandpa, my grandma yeah. ate my chickens. And we ate things. They left on a farm, but that's just what they yeah, did. Yeah, and we did too. I mean, we slaughtered hogs and stuff. That that's that was just what did you do. It? But we did not uh, do the chickens because they were pets. Okay, here we go. Solve using substitution. Solve using substitution. Step one. Subtract the 2x. Um, subtract the 2x. Thank you, Claire. If you are using substitution, then you have to get one letter by itself, any one you want, but Claire's right, that's the easiest one right there. Get him by himself by moving the 2x over, and then that's a y value, so it's going to go in in place of the y. So 3x minus 2 times 5 minus 2x equals negative 3. So I would rewrite this equation with this plugged in for the y. 
when you do that plug in, be sure you put it in parentheses because we're going to have to distribute. So 3x minus 10 plus 4x equals negative 3. I'm distributing. 7x minus 10 equals negative 3. 7x equals 7, so x equals 1. Then what do we do? Plug it back in somewhere. So if, and, and that's an x value. You can plug it in wherever you want. If I plug in 1, it looks like I'm going to get y equal to 3. So my answer is 1 comma 3. Remember, you can always plug back in any equation you want. Where are you plug in that x? Anywhere. Uh, you, you can plug it in here, here, or here. Doesn't matter. Plug it in anywhere. Now, the next problem is exactly the same, but we are doing elimination. So gang, your work is incredibly important because it's not even the answer I'm looking at so much as how you did it. You threw the multiply the bottom one by a negative three. That would be one very good option because if you multiply the bottom one by negative three, here's the top one. But now the bottom one's gonna be 15X minus three Y equal to negative 30. 17x equals negative 34, x equals negative 2. So 17x equals negative 34, and x equals negative 2. That's exactly right. Then, exactly like with substitution, we're going to go back to the beginning and plug in negative 2 for some x somewhere. It doesn't matter. I'll just put it in that top one. So if I put in negative 2 for x, I get negative 4 plus 3y equals negative 4. I think I'm going to get 0. Did you get 0? Yeah. So our answer is negative 2 comma 0. Nothing wrong with that. Perfectly okay. Alright, now we're going to do the Kramer's rule problem. Okay, now this stuff is old news, this uh, elimination and stuff, but Kramer's rule is newer, so we really got to try to remember how this works. Who can remember how we start Kramer's rule? Find the determinant. And the determinant I find first is the determinant of the coefficients. So I just make a determinant with my x and my y's. So does everybody get that? My x's are 3, negative 2, and my y's are 1, negative 5. All right, now evaluate that. Remember, it's downs minus ups. Let's see if we can all get the right answer. Downs minus ups. Be careful. I got negative 13. Pardon me? Negative yeah. You got what? Negative 13. Negative 13? How about the rest of you? I got that too. Everybody's getting negative 13 because the downs are negative 15, the ups are negative 2, but I have to subtract. Mm -hmm. And then you're right. That's the denominator. So whatever x is, it's over negative 13. And whatever y is, it's over negative 13. Now, to do the numerators, that's what we're missing now, is my x and my y numerator. I use these numbers. And I pretend that I can actually cut them out because I'm going to paste them on top of whatever letter it is I'm finding. So if I'm finding the x, I'm going to paste these on top of the x numbers. So I'll have a 7 and a 1 in the x spot, and then still a 1 and negative 5 in the y spot. Remember, these are the x's, these are the y's. So when I do the y, 
I'll paste these on top of the y's. So I have three negative two and uh, seven one. Okay. Now evaluate those and tell me what you get. Those are determinants. They're just like this one. I'm gonna do it in the same way. Downs minus up. Okay. I don't think it does actually. 26 over 13 would be 2. But I will cancel the negatives. I will make it 36 over 13 for my final answer. And then 17. Yep. And so that's just negative 17, 13. Remember, the negative can go anywhere in your final answer. So you can leave it in the bottom if you want. I usually put it in the top. Did everybody get negative 36 and 1? Subtract negative 36 minus 1. And 3 and negative 14 subtract. That's how we got 17. Yep. And it's negative because of the denominator negative. Okay. All right. That's Kramer's rule. Uh, let me see what's next. Oh, actually, I promise, we'll do one more problem and then we'll be done. We're going to find A inverse. A inverse. Okay, so A inverse. A is 1, 2, 3, negative 4. And your job is to find A inverse. We did one of these already today. Do you yep. remember? Mm -hmm. yeah. What do we have to do? First, determine. determine. So we do what we just did. We find the determinant. And you're all getting really good at that. Let's try it one more time. What is that determinant? Well, that's frustrating, Chase. What did you say the value of that determinant is? Negative 10. Yes. And it's negative 10 because it's negative 4 minus 6. Now, just hang on to that for a second. Don't do anything with it just yet. What's the next part of the problem? We flip the negative 4 and 1 in the opposite of We kind of make that random made up matrix, that new matrix, by flip flopping these. Now, Kids, when you do that flip-flop, you don't change any signs. You just flip-flop them. So now that I've got negative 4 and 1, then this becomes a negative 3 and this becomes a negative 2. Then what? Put them all over negative 10. Put them all over negative 10. Now this time... We are going to have to do some final answer work. So A inverse will be two fifths, one fifth, negative three tenths, and negative one tenth. Oh wait, no, that's positive three tenths, isn't it? I lost my negative. That's positive three tenths. And negative one tenth. Yes. Yep. Yep. You stay right where they're at, and you change their signs. You make them the opposite. In other words.